It is now my pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Alex McGregor is president of the McGregor Company, a, small, a farm supply business with 350 employees and offices in nearly four dozen rural communities in the inland northwest. He also heads McGregor Land and Livestock, the 128-year-old Eastern Washington Wheat and Livestock Ranch. The firm was honored as Centennial as a Centennial Corporation by Washington Secretary of State Sam Reed as one of the oldest incorporated businesses in the state. Alex currently serves on the boards of the Association of Washington Business and the Washington State His uh, Historical Society. He is a member of the Regulatory Performance Advisory Group of the Washington Department of Ecology. Alex served a tour of duty on the Governor's Global Competitiveness Council and has re recently been appointed to the Governor's Higher, Level, or Higher Education Funding Task Force. Alex is past president and also re recipient of the first Washington Association of Wheat Growers Outstanding Member of the Year Award. Alex was selected by the Washington Agriculture and Forestry Education Foundation as the Stu Bledsoe uh, Award recipient for his leadership in natural resources and industries. Alex earned his bachelor's degree from Whitman College, his master's and PhD from the University of Washington. Alex taught history at the University of Washington and Whitman College before joining his family firm. Please help me welcome, welcome Alex McGregor. Good afternoon, friends. I have the opportunity today to visit with you about the people of Inland Northwest Agriculture and the role that agriculture plays in our regional economy. It's something that gets me pretty excited and I hope it gets you excited too. I'll share with you some observations about a remarkable land, about remarkable agricultural people, with some panoramic scenes courtesy of my skilled photographer friend John Clement, who with another colleague of mine, Dick Shireman, a uh, historian extraordinaire has uh, collaborated on some very fine books that have come out that uh, I'll mention a little bit more about later. I'll also share with you some photographs from nearly 130 years of experience in agriculture that my family has had. A historical geographer, Don Meinig, a native of Palouse, said this about the inland Pacific Northwest. In the far northwest of the United States lies an unusual land. So sharply is it set apart in its surroundings that it can be recognized immediately at a mere glance. Approached from any direction, the visible change at its borders is striking. The forest thins, then abruptly ends. The mountains lower, then merge into a much smoother surface. And a different kind of country, open and undulating, rolls out before the viewer like a great interior sea. There was a fellow a long time ago who stayed at our ranch boarding house, the Hooper Hotel, in 1917, in fact. And, uh, and this fellow went back home and wrote his recollections of agriculture in the higher country uh, up above the lowland uh, flats of the inland northwest. Here's what he had to say. Late in June, the vast northwestern desert of wheat began to take on a tinge of gold, lending an austere beauty to that endless, rolling, smooth world of treeless hills. A thousand hills lay bare to the sky, and half of every hill was wheat, and half was fallow ground, and all of them, with the shallow valleys between, seemed big and strange and isolated, a lonely, hard, heroic country, the desert of wheat, Zane Gray. They came from across the mountains of the Rockies. They came from across the, the Atlantic Ocean and took measure of this ground, the early settlers did. Sam Fisher, a friend of my family's in, from the very early days and a neighbor, told stories about how this remarkable land was formed. Stories involving four giant brothers and their giant sister who attacked big beaver, seeking beaver oil from, to make their hair shiny. They 
had a battle that went on through much of eastern Washington. Everywhere there's an unusual geographic feature is a place where Big Beaver slapped his tail or dug in his claws. Remarkable stories. Big Beaver would have escaped except Spiel Ye Coyote sang his power song and tricked him and, and, uh, and the giant brothers and sister were able to capture him. Other more modern explanations of how this land came to be seem far-fetched in their own way. A land of massive lava flows up to 10,000 feet deep in places, lava flows that originated from fissures in the land in the Palouse country going as far south as the Grand Ronde of uh, Eastern Oregon. Lava flows that, that uh, culminated in places like Haystack Rock uh, near Tillamook, Oregon and Seaside, Oregon. Windblown dust 250 feet deep that came as a result of many different glacial episodes, uh, glacial expansion, and then as the glaciers retracted and uh, lakes in the area of Columbia Center dried up, all that soil blew up into areas north and east of here, creating the hills that are known as the Palouse. And then glacial floodwaters of biblical pr proportions equal, geologists tell us, to 20 times the flow of all the rivers in the world today. To this land came an interesting mix of people. Swiss Mennonites, Selbu Lutheran Norwegians, Finns, Irish, Catholic Germans, Missourians, New Yorkers. They lived in 12 by 16 foot shanties of rough cut wood, caulked with newspapers, grass, and mud. They dined on jackrabbit steaks. Bet you can eat more than one. That's a place that uh, Sam Fisher described very well that's uh, where our family put down roots, Palouse Falls. People would come here and put down deep roots. That's my grandpa AC on the right in the picture uh, closest to me, his brother Peter and his brothers John and Archie. They came here in 1882, convinced their dad to come with them from Ontario. He got to Pasco and saw nothing but a faded sign saying, watch Pasco grow with blowing sand and dust, and he thought this was a rather godforsaken country. But the boys were able to convince Dad to stick it out. They herded sheep on shares, exchanging their labor for part of the lamb crop, lived in tents, and measured the severity of winter weather by counting the number of nights, as they put it, that they had to sleep with the spuds, putting potatoes in their bedrolls to keep them from freezing. With dyed-in-the-wool enthusiasm, they took measure of the land. We got our first Columbia Basin dirt on our hands at Steamboat Rock, where my great uncle remembered uh, putting down roots. He would write in May of 1883, I have the pleasure of writing you a few lines concerning the Big Ben country. I went on foot with my blankets on my back. The longest walk I had without anything to eat was 60 miles. I always felt happy on the way, though, for I could see the country or hunt. So I did, and I took up 160 acres of land. Of course, I have not a deed yet, but I am a Yankee all the same. Alfred Holt, who would settle in what became the Palouse country, would write in 1872, You'd love this Palouse country. Our sheep, cattle, and horses will do splendid. But we would like some of your spare girls, as they're rather scarce out here. Whenever you find a girl who is good looking, smart, agreeable, and will furnish money for me, let me know. <laughs> they scratched out a living on farms with horsepower and mule power. Carl Penner, a farmer from Walla Walla, told me of mules. You couldn't beat the meanness out of them, it just don't work. But if you treat them halfway right and try to pat them and curry them and give them plenty to eat, they soon learned who was boss. Those were the days of two and three horse walking plows known as foot burners, known as that because your role if you were moving that plow was to stand on the back, use your weight to force that plowshare into the ground. Harrows were made of railroad ties cut in half with spikes driven through them. 
And it was an experience trying to farm this land. One old timer told me of a cattleman who was a neighbor in Adams County who was skeptical about what he could do. William Snyder recalled that J.F. Quas, that farmer, that rancher told him, what are you gonna do over there? You can't grow nothing there, never get any water there. Well, I says, we're gonna try. Maybe we can't grow nothing there and maybe we never get any water, but we're gonna try. That gave me the incentive to send a sample of the soil to the Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. for analysis. That analysis came back and said in time this would make pretty good wheat country, and it did. That's a start back in the 1890s of a relationship between university researchers, USDA researchers, and farm families that grew ever stronger over the years. Theirs was a dangerous trade. That's the Harvest crew on the McGregor Ranch, 1925. Thank you. One fellow I interviewed remembered his job of cleaning out a separator that had gotten clogged up. As he put it, we couldn't kill any time, so we hurried up. Mustard got jammed up near the cylinder. There were sharp rods in there. I jumped in to clear it out. After I got everything out and gave the engineer the go-ahead, I jumped to the ground and I felt something in my shoe. It was blood. My leg was cut clear down to the bone. So the fireman says, I got some turpentine. I said, well, that'll hurt, won't it? I said, no, if you do it right now, it won't hurt. And it didn't. Put that turpentine in there, and they had a dirty old shirt that they used, they used for a rag and slapped that around there, and you know that never did get sore. Much has changed, but some deeply held values remain. That's uh, sheep herders on the McGregor Ranch with the essentials, sheepdog, scotch, and shotgun. <laughs> McGregor brothers would get their first loan, $5,000, to buy a band of 2,000 ewes at 18% interest. My great uncle would claim that they got that, even though they had no assets at all, because they displayed five traits that he felt would always be crucial for agriculture industry, work, character, honesty, and fair dealings. And if you think about the things that are special with agriculture, it's a trade where a handshake means something and where your word counts, pretty special field today too. Well, there are values that endure. My cousin Bill McGregor put it this way too. The pioneer settlers came here loaded with two qualities that helped them succeed, an unquenchable optimism and a tenacity that verged on stubbornness. These qualities were useful then, useful now, and will be useful in the future. How right he was. So I asked the rhetorical question up there, are farms and ranches the last bastion of family business in America a mere historical curiosity? What do you think, are they? I'll take a little drink here and give you an answer. The answer is no, agriculture is a cornerstone of Washington's economy. 39,000 farms produced over $7 billion in crops in 2009. The $35 billion food and agriculture industry employs 11 to 12 percent of the people in, or contributes 11 to 12 percent to the economy and is the largest employer in the state of Washington employing 160,000 people. It's a big deal. More than $11 billion of products are shipped out through Columbia River ports, through Washington ports there and, and in Puget Sound. The Snake and Columbia are a world-class transportation conduit. Across the river, Portland is the number one port in the nation for shipping barley, number two for corn. When George W. Bush was president, he went there and said, more wheat is shipped on the Columbia than America ships on any other river. If you're a wheat farmer, that's good news. If you're somebody who relies upon wheat to sustain your life, that's good news. <coughs> the nomination of a staunch advocate for removing dams to the post of Assistant Secretary of the Interior for Fish, Wildlife, and Parks is a reminder of how important it is that we communicate with Congress about the value of our river system for crop production and transport. 
her Her claim that the Columbia Snake River salmon runs teeter on the edge of extinction is flat wrong, as we will see in a little bit. It's a diverse agriculture cornucopia, this inland northwest agriculture. One to $1 $1.7 billion of revenue for the tree fruit industry annually. Potatoes on 165,000 acres enough to load almost 45,000 Boeing jumbo airplanes uh, to the hilt, or to fill 50-pound cartons that would go all the way around the world twice. The highest dryland wheat yields in the world. A remarkable agricultural cornucopia this is. Here's a sampling of the top 10 crops out of 300 in this state in 2009 in millions of dollars. Apples, 1.5 billion. Milk, 684 million. Potatoes, 646. Wheat, 597. Cattle, 473. Hay, 442. Nursery, 293. Hops, 264. Cherries, 224. Grapes, 210. And I could keep on going down to 200, 150, 100, and many other fields. Awesome productivity that the people of agriculture produce in this land. Agriculture flat lights up the local economy. That's a John Clement picture of uh, extraordinary proportions. You can't quite capture it there, but agriculture does what lightning does. It lights things up. Take a look right here. In Benton County, 1,600 farms, $526 million of revenue. Top three crops, potatoes, apples, and grapes. Franklin, almost 900 farms, 467 million in revenue, potatoes, apples, and hay. Yakima, over 3,500 farms, 1.2 billion in revenue, apples, milk, and hay. Processors play a key role, too. Take a look in Benton County, over 2,000 jobs. Franklin County, almost 2,500. Yakima, almost 3,300. And those are in an important field related to agriculture. And there are several more fields, too. Many, many industries related to agriculture and dependent upon our agricultural productivity. As I think about where we've been and where we're headed, water, stewardship of the land, and agricultural research are crucial elements to whatever success we've had in the past and to what lies ahead. There was a book written in 1899 in the very early days before uh, irrigation became a reality here that he titled The Blessing of Aridity. And he described this uh, in, in an interesting way. The land which the casual traveler, speaking from the splendid depths of ignorance and prejudice, condemns as worthless and fit only to hold the earth together is in reality rich and durable beyond the most favored areas of the humid <laughs> regions. Well, Smythe was right, of course, but it took a long time to get there. Would rain follow the plow? This is an example of a farm in the Quincy area uh, that I've learned quite a bit about recently that endured and, uh, and quite a story. There was hope that if you went into the driest areas, and land, land uh, barons promoted this too, that the steel surface of the plow would bring an invisible fog of vapors and turn the area suddenly humid. Uh, alas, that did not happen. There were some tough years. A fellow I interviewed last year, now 91 years old, Elmer Paff on the left-hand side there, talked about his family's experiences at rough Washington near Moses Lake. We had to walk home from school with one of our parents holding hands so we wouldn't get lost in the dust. Dad would sit in the house reading the paper with a kerosene lamp. The dust would gather on the paper and he'd have to shake it off so he could keep reading. Storms might last as long as three days. Afterwards, we'd find rabbits and mice blinded by the sand wandering through the drifts. You could walk over the fence in many places, the drifts were that deep. Mom used a big grain shovel to dust the house. 
The search for water was an ongoing saga. Those are pictures from the McGregor Orchard. Our farm is near where Franklin and Adams and Whitman counties meet along the lower Palouse River. And that was our uh, first effort to get water to that country. We would sell 50 car uh, train loads of apples out of there. Glen Ian brand with a Scotchman in kilts and his head a big red apple. We raised apples and peaches and apricots and plums and cherries and pear trees. Alas, the Palouse River did not live up to its promoter's hopes as a river capable of irrigating the entire Columbia Basin. Uh, maybe you could hope that in uh, the spring, but by July the river would prove uh, not up to the challenge. There was a long search for something better. My great uncle Pete on the left there was on the first Columbia Basin Commission that took on the assignment of figuring out how to get water to this country. The Palouse had proven inadequate to the task. Their first effort, and many years went into this, was to have the idea of using gravity and tapping into the Ponderé River near present-day Newport, Washington, and gravity feeding water all the way to the Columbia Basin. Well, that was a stretch, and over time, an alternative involving Grand Coulee Dam became uh, more and more logical. I found a progress edition of the Spokesman Review in our old files from 1942, highlighting Grand Coulee Dam, and power was a big story at that time. Reliable irrigation water would follow in May 1948. At 11.15 on May 15th, Judge Horrigan gave a signal to open the canal floodgates for an experimental canal project right near Pasco. It was the culmination of a 50-year struggle to find irrigation water that was reliable. 200 people were on hand, various chambers of commerce. The Bureau of Reclamation started sending out information urging people to consider taking a piece of this land. 2,500 announcements seeking applicants for the newly irrigated land. This illustration shows water scarcity around the globe. And the good color is that blue color, the color we have here. You can see parts of the world, in fact, parts of the southwest US uh, face water shortages. We've got plenty of water, though sometimes we argue about its use. Well, there were some tough lessons to learn in this new land, even before the water arrived from the Columbia. Kids would cast formaldehyde-laden seed, seeds out of wagons. Younger kids would use strychnine-treated wheat on squirrel hills. Washington Agricultural College took on its first assignment in 1893, enlisting a student to walk 800 miles of rail lines in eastern Washington and get rid of the Russian thistle. His professors announced that he'd been successful, but three years later, Ranch and Range, a farm journal of that time, said, the whole Russian army, if it were here engaged in destroying this thistle, could hardly exterminate it. The DuPont Corporation in 1911 came out with a handy pamphlet called Farming with Dynamite, but fortunately not too many people used it to try to level their fields. <laughs> On the McGregor Ranch, there were very few tools we had available. One of them in managing apples and, and fighting insects was an organic product, lead arsenate, that was surely a terrible pro product to use, but the only one they had. My cousin would write in 1926, the apples showed too much arsenic to be reassuring, but if the sorters wipe each one with their gloves, we'll get by. <laughs> My cousin Bill would remember growing up there and said, we worked the land to death with our horses, harrowed it to beat hell, and then let it blow a while. There were ditches I remember as a kid so deep you could walk down. I remember very well as a kid with my brother and sister riding in the back seat of a car as mom and dad tried to peer through a fog of topsoil uh, and drive us 
uh, somewhere from our little town where we grew up of Hooper, Washington, typically through a town then appropriately named Dusty Washington. The progress since those days is quite striking. Farmers would urge scientists in 1914 to bring science down out of the skies and help us hitch it to our plows. There were lots of ideas, but they were just that and no interaction between college uh, professors and, and people out in the field. 20 wheat growers would meet with state college leaders and they spoke of a crisis. We settled in this district, they wrote, raised large crops, became overconfident and exploited the soil until it became deficient in nutrients and infested with weeds, thus resulting in agricultural disaster. They urged scientists to get out of the laboratory and get out into the field to help provide practical solutions. University people didn't even have the hands-on experience of farmers through trial and error. They were starting from scratch in an unusual land. Dating back to that time in 1914, since then, farmers, scientists, and local businesses have put together a century-long alliance that has brought spectacular improvements in stewardship, in conservation, in fertility management. Hands-on science on the farm is a big part of that. 63 years ago, a soil scientist, Harley Jaco, willing to challenge conventional thinking, and our two ranch store clerks were pioneer leaders in the fertilizer industry. That uh, soils testing lab on the right-hand side is in the basement of the Hooper General Store in the heart of downtown Hooper, Washington. Beginning with the soils lab in the basement and easy flow dry spreaders, Dad said the good thing about easy flows was they streaked every acre so farmers could see that fertilizer did something. Maybe not in the desired way, but it did something. Beginning with that, uh, we would grow to serving almost four dozen communities with 65 crop advisors and uh, 280 other people. Commercial fertilizer today is responsible for 40 to 50 percent of crop yields. Two and a half billion people around the globe, Scientific American reported, would not be fed without them. We as agriculture continue to make progress in using those tools more efficiently. Farm technology changed fast over the years too. The internal combustion engine very much revolutionized agriculture. One farmer told me, you hated to quit the mules. You know, there was just some life. You get attached to a mule the same as you do people, but you couldn't get anybody to drive the mules. The caterpillar came along and you got yourself a caterpillar. On the McGregor Ranch in 1929, our first internal combustion engine was a Holt 75. The ranch guys started it with a crowbar in the flywheel and they would yank on the crowbar and then run for cover out in the summer follow as the starting mechanism flew through the air. <laughs> Our neighbor down in Washtokna, Levi Sutton, said that the Holt 75 offered a grower his choice of two convenient speeds, slow and damn slow. <laughs> Farm families have produced dramatic results. Statisticians tell us that the average Washington farmer is today 57 years old. During the lifetime of that farmer and those like him, farm families have done these things I laid out there. They have increased yields over 250 percent, reduced waterborne soil erosion 85 percent, reduced dust six-fold since the dirty 30s, reduced stubble burning 22-fold. Put all that together, the biggest gains in productivity and stewardship of any generation since cereal crops were first sown 12,000 years ago. Is there room for continued progress? Of course there is. Is there an exciting story of farm families making a difference? Absolutely. When I was a kid, I remember those chin high ditches and I look now even through a very wet spring and see a land that is stable and good farming practices would come a long ways. It's not that people didn't care in the early days, but it's a matter of learning together with scientists. Ours is a close-knit business of 340 people dedicated to serving farmers and serving them well. Craig Webley in that picture is calibrating a fumigation pump. 
soon to check his phone to view charts online of wind speeds and flow rates. My dad's recipe from pioneer days, invest what you earn to help your neighbors, find dedicated people, and be willing to embrace the only constant we have seen, change. Our folks, like so many people who serve farmers, have a passion for what they do. Gary Bubba, born to fertilize Brookshire, puts it this way. I'm proud of a job well done at the end of a long, long day. We've worked as a team to solve a problem or get a lot done. We've worked hard, fast, long, well. Kevin House, a little more subdued, but not much. I like using my hands and my mind and getting dirty and hot and tired and looking back and feeling we've accomplished something. I like being part of a team that can get the job done. Building relationships and respect and credibility. Anybody can have a job, but when I go to work, I'm going to my job. The leader of one of our teams that has won a National Environmental Respect Award, Ted Deerkup, said this about stewardship of the land. We're proud to help growers reduce erosion while producing bountiful harvests to feed hungry people around the globe. We're dedicated and passionate about serving the true practicing stewards of the environment, farmers, and helping them protect this precious land. My dad used to say, never through these doors shall a computer pass. <laughs> I've conceded defeat on that, and my son is quite skilled with it. That's our training center for agronomics and new technology, often filled with crop advisors and farmers learning how to apply the products of digital technology to what is becoming known as precision agriculture. We never get stuck in a rut, although this spring there were some deep ones. My dad used to say, you can't stand still in this business of agriculture. If you do, you will slowly, slowly die. There are a bunch of precision agriculture tools that make dollars and cents on the farm. Digitized field maps, record keeping and enterprise budgeting, long-term crop planning, GPS guided tractors. When I was a kid, running a tractor, you'd look back through a fog of dust and hope you could find your mark, but often not. Now with GPS, you can be accurate within a fraction of an inch. It's remarkable what satellite technology, computer technology has made available. Here's how a customer digitally monitors his farm. It allows him to monitor circles from any internet access, iPhone, iPad, laptop, or desktop. He can start, stop, change direction, slow down, or just take a look. As fish runs surge in the inland northwest, we're at risk of agriculture getting left holding the bag. This past November, runs of sockeye set modern day records, more over Bonneville Dam uh, than since its inception in 1938. 20 years ago, there was a single sockeye that made it to Redfish Lake, elevation 4,600 feet in northern Idaho. This year, there were almost 2,000 of them. Chinook runs at twice the modern day record. In fact, so many fish that in November, scientists started to worry that there might not be enough food in the ocean for them. Meanwhile, we face some challenges related to the Endangered Species Act. My title there, Doc Dan and Bringing Administrators to the Farm. Products used to combat weeds and other pests come up for re-registration every 15 years. The Endangered Species Act requires Fishery Service and EPA to confer formally about possible impacts on salmon. Washington State Department of Agriculture, led by Dan Newhouse has done uh, stream analysis for the better part of 10 years, showing that crop protectants are not harming salmon. But the two agencies have sparred and not formally conferred, leaving a judge to issue stern mandates. The net effect could be loss of valuable crop protectants or to have to leave buffers around fields, perhaps as large as 1,000 feet, making it impractical to protect crops from pests. The extraordinary Doc Hastings, chair of the House Natural Resources Committee, and 17 of his colleagues responded quite frankly, quite bluntly. This flawed process, Doc would write, will force family farms out of business 
and devastate rural communities and trade throughout the districts we represent. We urge you to halt moving forward with regulations that are knowingly based on shoddy science and written with minimal opportunity for public input. Our constituents deserve better. We organized through the Wheat Growers Association last week a tour of EPA pesticide administrators from Washington, D.C. and fisheries folks from D.C. And, and the Northwest. At our old ranch general store in the heart of downtown Hooper, Washington Director of Agriculture Dan Newhouse made a compelling case for using sound science and not academic models, research his agency has been doing for a long time. The stakes are big for our economy. If a larva from a cherry fruit fly or coddling moth is found in a fruit export, the entire load will be rejected. And Washington State could lose export privileges to that country. As Dan Newhouse puts it, we're going to continue to raise our voices. Washington State Department of Ag water quality research shows that growers have been responsible users of agricultural pesticides. Farmers need the right chemicals in the toolbox to combat pests and disease. Customers, consumers demand the right high quality, abundant foods, and our international trading partners require us to certify that our exports are pest free. We believe we'll win that battle, but it's important to try to make contact with people setting the rules and, and uh, establish some dialogue. We must fight the battle for farm families, all of us, together when urgent issues come up. That's an illustration of, of uh, handouts of the Agriculture Energy Alliance, an idea that a half a dozen of us around the country had several years ago that now involves 117 organizations. When issues related to energy and agriculture come up and we can respond to members of Congress with that kind of um, uh, resume, it's pretty impressive. For farm families, the risks are daunting. Theirs is a success story, friends, in so many ways. For consumers, for the environment, for the regional economy, and once in a while, for farm and ranch families themselves, the people who've made it all possible. I think of their innovative spirit, their restless hope for future advances in agricultural science and better days ahead, and the sense of satisfaction that comes from producing foodstuffs unexcelled in quality at bargain basement prices for consumers in America and around the globe. Returns are erratic, sometimes less than could be received for an entry-level city job, and the risks are great, but there's a sense of satisfaction that comes from caring for the land and leaving it in better condition when you're done with your career than it was when you started. We've lost neighbors along the way. 40% of dryland wheat farmers went out of business in a decade, 1997 to 2006, for example. But we're learning to pull together and tell our story, and it's a mighty powerful one. I believe we'll win the day if we each pitch in and do our share. On the right-hand side there are handouts we use at every one of our agronomy meetings where I, I visit with growers about key issues, try to give a one-page summary of those issues, and then ask them to put in their own words their thoughts together to a member of Congress. I remember doing that one time and, and having a friend of mine uh, send me a printed copy of something he'd sent to a legislator. And on it, he put a sticky note that said, Alex, this won't do any damn good, but I'm doing it to get you off my back. <laughs> well, I got a call from, a con from that congressional office asking me if it'd be okay to use that fellow's comments in congressional testimony. I called him and asked, and he said later he about fell out of the tractor. <laughs> Farmers have a good reputation, their voices are heard. I remember the first time I testified before Congress, 27 years ago, speaking out for agricultural exports and farm families. I did pretty well with my prepared text, was holding my own, and then I started getting grilled by a particularly irascible senator who was telling me how busy they were, how important their jobs were, and why was I there talking about exports. And I said to myself, Alex, you don't have to take that. 
Think about it, you were in the top four of your graduating class at Hooper grade school. It was a class of four. <laughs> you don't have to take that. And I thought about all those farm families and turned around and gave them both barrels. All of us in our own way pitch in. I think of the remarkable achievements of Chris Voigt, executive director of the Washington State Potato Commission, who took on a 1,200 potato, just potatoes diet. And you can see the ground rules there, seasonings are okay, and cooking oil, no butter, no sour cream, no gravy, nothing else with any calories. Why did you do it, Chris, I asked. Well, I was upset, he said. Potatoes were being blamed for childhood obesity, diabetic epidemics, USDA was pro prohibiting potatoes from the WIC program and from school breakfast, and I wanted to show something. Well, boy, did he do it. 300 media interviews, 14 countries, BBC World, Finland, many other places, 140,000 weekly hits on a website and Facebook page, thousands of mentions in blogs and tweets. What was the result? Chris reports his weight went down from 197 to 176, blood sugar from 104 to 94, cholesterol from 214 to 147, triglycerides from 135 to 75. He put together a list of the cost to highlight this potato nutrition campaign, and here they are. Domain name, $22.59. Website software, $80.90. YouTube props, $76.01. Logo design, $187.50. Total, $366.90. Getting to eat potatoes every day, priceless. <laughs> There's some work ahead to finish up the idea of the mighty Columbia. 65% of the acres projected in the original uh, Columbia Basin project are uh, in production. There are some other areas that are not. There are temporary wells, some of them 2,000 feet deep and even deeper, put in, especially in Grant County, where they were authorized by the state as a temporary measure until water arrived. Well, the water hasn't arrived, and those water tables are going down and down and down. A major memorandum of understanding, the Columbia River Initiative, was put together by irrigation districts in the Department of Ecology. A Columbia River management, water management plan in 2006 works underway on a second Weber siphon. A second project, completing construction of the pothole supplemental feed route, uh, is, is another major assignment. It's a backup water delivery system for the potholes will provide more water for the southern part of the project. When completed, could add 150,000 acre feet of additional East Low Canal capacity. Phase one on the Frenchman Hills Wasteway completed. Phase two up ahead, Crab Creek and feed routes. Improvements at Banks Lake too, other modifications. That shows you the Odessa sub area on the right hand side of that uh, enclosed area. There's a sub Odessa sub-area special study, a Lincoln County passive rehabilitation project designed to bring water to Crab Creek, replacing groundwater that uh, has been lost with water from the Columbia Basin project. It's quite a story moving the peg forward despite the challenges. The next step is a final environmental impact statement on the Odessa sub-area special study figuring out how to replace groundwater for 50 to 100,000 acres of irrigated land, a study due out late this year or early next. Pretty impressive the gains that have been made by showing how to address issues from a perspective of farmers, from a perspective of protecting fish, and from a perspective of focusing on communities. It's important to do that to find ways that everybody has a stake to move the peg forward. We need you to speak out on something, too. We need you to speak out on the urgency of agricultural research, agricultural education. At the federal level, budget cuts in the hopper would drop funding 
20% below 2010 levels. Locally, the resurgent Columbia Basin College program that has so much promise and has, has brought us talented young people is at risk with funding cuts. I think it's short-sighted if we don't, as a state, provide enough monies to keep programs like that going. We need those young people. Agricultural return, agricultural research returns uh, good uh, ROI on the money for the people of Washington, the people of the United States. An estimated 45% return uh, per year on agricultural research. Ag is one of the few sectors of the economy that contributes positively to our balance of trade. Farmers and scientists get results. This is a study done by Stanford in, and the National Academy of Science. It shows what a difference high yield agriculture makes. Yield gains have meant that we have not had to tear up fragile lands, have not had to tear up uh, rangeland and forest. As a result, we have avoided what would have been massive amounts of greenhouse gases emitting, 590 billion metric tons of CO2. Yield spikes have enabled us to avoid tree clearing, and the emissions, had we had to clear all those trees worldwide, would have been equal to one-third of the greenhouse gases created since the dawn of the Industrial Revolution. High yield agriculture is practiced in the Columbia Basin is a great success story. Those Stanford researchers point out that one of the best ways we can make an investment for the future is to invest in agricultural research. It's the cheapest way to combat greenhouse gases. Farmers and all who consume the products of farms need to pitch in. Norman Borlaug, that extraordinary Nobel Prize winning plant breeder, one of the leaders of the Green Revolution, who died a couple of years ago in his 90s, would write, if we allow misconceptions, not science and good judgment, to dictate the future of agriculture, we as Americans will be guilty of displaying a diminished gene frequency for common sense. <laughs> he also reminded us of the lessons we learned as kids growing up on farms that a job worth doing is worth doing right. Borlaug urged all of us in agriculture and those we serve to, as he put it, think big, fight complacency, you can make a difference. If you do that, you'll find the ability to do something for yourself, your family, the community, the nation, and the world. We all have high stakes in serving a fast-growing world population. Every second, three new mouths to feed. Every two and a half seconds, we lose an acre of farm ground. The head of the World Food Program puts it this way, a hungry world is a dangerous world. Without food, people have only three options. They riot, they emigrate, or they die. None of these are acceptable options. During the next 20 years alone, world trade in three major commodities, wheat, corn, and soybeans will grow 50%. Agriculture is a big deal. Most of that growth is going to come from demand across the Pacific, in places like China and India in particular, places that we in the Pacific Northwest are ideally positioned to serve because of our geographic location. Agriculture already contributes positively to the balance of trade in big time ways. We export five times as many farm products to China as we receive in return. Empty cargo ships heading across the Pacific look for cargo, and I can't think of something better to put in there than agricultural products. And hey, Washington agriculture is romping. Washington agriculture is making a huge difference in the world of exports. In the last quarter of 2010, we set a new record. In the first quarter of 2011, we broke that record. Take a look at it. These are leading destinations and top three commodities uh, that received crops grown in Washington between October 1st of last year and March 31st of this year. Japan, 794 million wheat, hay, potatoes. Canada, 592 seafood, apples, veggies. China, 247, seafood, potatoes, apples. Philippines, 211, wheat, dairy, potatoes. Taiwan, 187 million wheat, apples, potatoes. 
Mexico, 152 million apples, dairy, potatoes. Washington agriculture is a pretty powerful presence. When I look at agriculture and where it's going to be in the year 2020, I think of the 500 million ton challenge. That's how much we have to increase productivity, enough to feed 800 million more people around the globe. There will be many opportunities to make a difference. Regional specialization will be the order of the day. The fellow pictured there, Jim Cook, National Science Fellow, retired dean of Washington State University, wheat breeder extraordinaire, points out that we have global advantages in the state of Washington, advantages that come from productivity, proximity to markets, accumulated know-how, some real strong factors. So when he looks at who will prosper in the year 2020 and beyond, he uses as examples potato growers in the Columbia Basin and wheat growers in the Inland Northwest, as well as uh, other fields and that great diversity of crops. It's time to join forces in supporting sound science and well-trained future leaders. Borlaug pointed out shortly before he died in a remarkable editorial in the Wall Street Journal, we need to double food production and we've got fewer acres than ever. We need to double food production within 50 years. The fact is we need both productivity and sustainability. And we can't have both. Who said that? Bill Gates, who put $1.4 billion into research uh, in the world of genetics and agriculture with, with a particular focus on Africa. There's a great sense and a growing sense that we need to, all of us, pitch in for agriculture. I think our young people have it right when they come home from school and recite the FFA creed. I believe in the future of agriculture with a faith born not of words but of deeds, achievements won by the present and past generations of agriculturalists, in the promise of better days through better ways, even as the better things we now enjoy have come to us from the struggles of former years. I believe that American agriculture can and will hold true to the best traditions of our national life, and that I can exert an influence in my home and community which will stand solid for my part in that inspiring work. I have an illustration there of a couple of books, Northwest Dryland Seasons, recently on the market featuring two of my friends and me who collaborated on it. Dick Shireman, the extraordinary historian in the back, John Clement, the photographer. We've got a few copies of, the, of that and, uh, and an order form if you're interested. Finding Chief Kamayakan, another remarkable book. Uh, we'd be happy to share copies of that too. We're enthusiastic about what can be achieved pulling together. As Borlaug put it, without high yield agriculture and irrigation, millions would have starved or millions of acres of pristine land would have had to have been broken by the plow. Dedicated farm families are part of an essential process of feeding a burgeoning world population. Have a passion about what you do and you will make a difference. The challenge of feeding that burgeoning population is a daunting one. Borlaug estimated we must produce more food worldwide in the next 50 years than has been grown in the last 10,000. We've got fewer acres to work with, almost 4.5 million acres of the state of Washington, once land supporting farms, ranches, and wildlife, have now produced their last crops, subdivisions, and pavement. I ask you this, friends. Producing more food on fewer acres, using resources wisely and responsibly, who can meet these challenges? I'll stake my bet on farm families being a big part of that answer. Dedicated people with determination, cast iron optimism, hope for the future, and a love for the land. Please join my Columbia Basin colleagues and I, a few of my colleagues shown there, Jex Bjorn, Jim Bott from Eltopia, Larry Childers of Horse Heaven, Kennewick, Pete Romano of Quincy, 
Please join all of us in recognizing these extraordinary people, these stewards of our land and our grasslands, and these bastions of our economy. Remarkable people and a remarkable land, and families who have provided a wonderful agricultural heritage for us all. We are darn proud of our farm and ranch neighbors, and I hope you are too. Thank you, friends.